All right, hello, 14ers, brothers and sisters. We are in for an exciting video today. It is March 18th, 2020. We have today with us our brother that I have spoken about recently. Uh, our brother, Richard from Arkansas, is, I'll say, on the line with us. He's with us on VC, um, but verbal. And uh, we're going to get to him here in a little bit. But I just, I, I felt this, you know, when you hear a bit of the story and, and the things that we've talked about over the last two or three videos when we bring up um, uh, what Richard and I had spoken about and why he contacted me and how he held off for a few months until just the last three weeks or so. I mean, I, I fully believe it was purpose filled by the Lord for the timing that what you're going to see even based on the uh, the title of this video, which I'm not completely sure what it is. I have an idea, um, but you guys will know as you're seeing it, um, which is about cleansing our robe, about having our gorgeous robes pure and white. And I've spoken about this brother recently in, like I was saying in the last couple of videos, we bring him up once in a while. And those who have been on Discord, uh, we were talking about him in there as well. And then Discord, the people were just, they were just like, well, okay, well, what about this? And how do I do this? We're going to cover a bunch of those types of things in relation to baptism and but not in a way I believe any of you, or at least the vast majority of you, have seen it to this detail. Um, he understands the baptism and the repentance through the repentance, the remission of sin and the receiving of the Spirit in a way that I have never understood it in my life being completely revealed from Scripture. He understands it from Scripture without needing Scripture as I understand the end time revealing without needing the scripture anymore. So I think the timing, I think it is such a blessing. I heeded the understanding. I heeded the words and I went and cleansed my garment and I was fully aware. I was fully understanding why the Lord was having me understand this now and why it's to then bring it to the rest of you. Because like me, you guys understand we're being prepared for the third heaven. We're not looking to be prepared to be going to paradise, right? Will, will we be able to go to paradise? Sure, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be able to go to paradise too, but we're preparing a bride. We're preparing those who are watching and praying. But there's been a number of people that I haven't been able to give a, a great answer as to, well, what what is the difference? What, am I going to be ready? Is it just watching and praying? You know, because I would assume that everybody's that everybody has, um, you know, has ba been baptized, that everybody's repented and so forth. But you're going to understand it's repentance before baptism, and he's going to get into that. And so I, I never really had a, a crystal clear answer except to say watching and praying. But what's the difference? What is the difference between those who are who will be count uh, accounted worthy? compared to those who will be remaining. What's that difference for that 10% of the church, that bride of Christ of the Gentiles? What, what's There's got to be something that, that the Lord wants us to do to make us be sure we're pure. Because I was going to say this a little bit later on, but you'll remember our little sister Mila, when she said she was in heaven and she saw Jesus and she went to Jesus's room in that area in heaven, and there was the long table at the end and what he looked like in his gorgeous robe and everything. And then there was another area where there was a lot of people. It was like a second area. Well, I looked at that as like the third heaven section compared to paradise. And what caught me off guard when she said this is she said that there were those that had black spots on their robes. And that started a, a conversation with my, within my thoughts saying, well, wait a second, if it's, if there's people in heaven with black spots on their robes, and her mom asked her the question, she said, no, they'll have it forever, I thought, whoa, how on earth is that possible? Well, in a conversation with our brother Richard, I came to understand what Mila saw, yet Richard wasn't telling me about the story of Mila, he was just explaining these things to me, and the difference was, 
Repentance is the covering over of those black spots or is the covering over with the blood of Christ. And when blood dries, think of when blood dries, it's black, right? Well, you're going to see today as we go into this, as, 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 we, as he goes in and he starts sharing this, we're not going to do it right away, but we're going to get into it after I introduce him a little bit. But you're going to see that through the, after that repentance, there, you need to wash that robe. We don't want a robe just covered in the blood of Jesus. We want that to be washed away clean from what it was covering. And that's what he's going to share with us today in that receiving of the Spirit as well afterwards. So I'm going to let him really go into that. I'm going to introduce him now and say hello. But I want to get into a couple of other things in the now as well that, um, that some well-known brothers, brothers in Christ that we know of are speaking about. Some people have shared it uh, in the Ministry Revealed Forum. And I want to bring it to light with you guys so you can see that everything we've been talking about here in Ministry Revealed. We said that the peace deal had to be revealed before the 70th year. We, had, we knew that after Israel, this 70, um, when the 70 was over, that everything would begin. Well, do you guys realize Charles shared with me last night, I hadn't noticed it, but that the state of emergency, or, or sorry, that it was uh, declared a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, it was on March 11th. You see, all of these things, it is happening in these times that we said. When I go to the coffee shop, I went there today and I was telling them, hey, you guys know what I do for a living, right? You know what I do for a living? Remember I said after Israel completed 70? Well, are you aware of what's going on? And they went, oh man, yeah, that's right. I said, well, guys, you got to think about these things. And I told them about a few other things. Well, when you see what Perry Stone said in the last couple of days in a word he received from the Lord, and then when you see what Chuck Pierce said, you're going to be like, well, wait a second. Why don't they understand it? And then we talked about Wormwood and, and what um, what uh, Tom Horn received in a vision. And with the date and or, or with the year that it was in. And we talked about that before. But I'm going to touch on all three briefly uh, after the introduction. And you're going to see these are all things that have been revealed. We have understood these times. We understood these years. And we understood it because the Lord has revealed to us through the Spirit that the Lord will return after 13 feet down on the Mount of Olives and he will fulfill the 14th year here on earth. And everybody that says, you're crazy, you don't understand, it's not 14, it's 7. We have proven it forward and backward over and over again. And look around. Look at where we are. All right, guys, it's amazing. God is good. He has blessed us. We don't have fear of death. We have life. You know, we've got life within us. So let's let's rejoice. But I understand there's fear for family maybe and friends. But it shouldn't be fear. It should be prayer. All right? So be, be encouraged and be strengthened. And when we get into today's and you hear what he's going to talk about, you're going to understand it in a way you never have before. And there's people that have said, well, how, how can I be baptized if I don't have a bathtub? You know, I'm in lockdown. I'm in I'm in a country where it's complete lockdown. I don't I don't have a bathtub, but we have a shower. Can we use a a shower? You know, or somebody says, I I live alone. I'm in lockdown and I'm single. Um, I have a shower, but I also have a tub. We'll cover all of that to make sure that guys, what this is towards the tail end of this ministry coming to to a to a completion, if you will. I'm not saying I'm not doing this anymore. I'm saying that the tribulation, we know where we're at. You guys have watched this video, right? This was the revealing of it. This was the confirmation with that sister in Christ, right? Jodel, who gave us the confirmation that nobody on earth knew to tell us that what I knew was on track and the Lord heard. And here is this brother, our brother Richard, right here at this time to say, now let's clean our robes. Excuse me. Now let's make sure everybody's robe gets cleansed and washed away. Yes, the blood hides the stain so that the Father doesn't see it. That's why they were in heaven. But we're not uh, in, in, in the portion of paradise in heaven. But the Lord, through this ministry and through us, we are not being prepared for paradise. We're looking to go to the third heaven. So with that, 
after making our brother wait for almost 10 minutes. Richard, my brother from another mother, over in Arkansas, say hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. And uh, I want to say that it is a joy to be with Alan again and now to be with all of you. Um, Alan and I have certainly had some wonderful time fellowship over the last couple of weeks and uh, several phone calls and uh, just fellowshipping around the word. And we've enjoyed that time. And, and I, I truly believe that, as Alan has said, that God did um, cause me to wait and pause for a moment because I did not want to interrupt anything that he was getting from the Lord on end time ministry revealed. Uh, but now I believe is the time, and through that contact, uh, obviously it is what the Lord wants. Uh, and I do want to say one thing in this introduction is I know we're all facing these coronavirus fears and a lot of turmoil, and we've expected that, maybe not so much because sometimes we think we might have escaped already, but we as the bride can understand and rest assured that we can abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I just want to encourage you as we get ready to go into this, just go back and take a look at Psalms 91. Exactly. I believe it will expel a lot of your fears, and uh, we can go through this and make it through to the time that we're all looking forward to. So I praise the Lord for this time, and I know it's an exciting time, and this is going to be an exciting video. Absolutely. Amen, brother. And, you know, it, it's interesting that you bring up uh, Psalms 91. Uh, you, you can't see it on the screen, but I'm going to bring it up very briefly to show people something that I meant to bring up a couple times in the video. There's pastors and preachers and YouTube channel People are, are talking about Psalms 91 everywhere. But there's something I haven't heard them show the people. And that's because most don't use a program like our beautiful trusted eSort. And... What it is, is when we go into Psalms, we know Psalms 91 verse 1, 2. Well, when we go into Psalms 91 verse 3, it says, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisium pestilence. And a lot of people say, see, this is what we're talking about. This is probably that pestilence. And, you know, they're going through and they're they're explaining it. And, you know, <laughs> maybe it's uh, it gives people comfort when there's 10,000 dying on one side and 1,000 dying on the other but that they're protected from it. So that's where we're getting comfort. However, this is what I wanted to bring up. The word for pestilence, um, we can see it comes from the word, uh, the Hebrew word 1698, and it means pestilence. It means a plague in the sense of destroying. But the word for noisium comes from the Hebrew word 1942. And it comes from, check this out, this virus, okay, this virus we know is a respiratory, right? It's a respiratory. It's a breath virus. Well, the Hebrew word for noisium pestilence, the word for noisium being Hebrew word 1942, comes from the Hebrew word, the root word is 1933. And the word is, means properly to breathe, now, I thought that was really interesting that this noisium pestilence is coming from the root word, which means to breathe. So here we are with this pestilence after Psalms 90, which we know is the Psalms 90 and 10 and to let us number our days. And we know it's speaking about the 14 years. We've revealed that at Pentecost, June 1st, the Lord confirmed it is when the 14 years will begin. And prior to that is the escape, the 40 days, then 10 to when the Holy Spirit will come on Pentecost, empower those people that are chosen and will leave. And the 14 years will begin. Now, this, these are some of the things that I want to get into. Now, I want to show before, before we, have, we hand it over completely to Peter, I want to, I want to be able to show you guys here some things that we're going to show three things. And Richard is free to jump in now at any point. And I know he's probably going to jump in when we get into this apostolic piece. But I want you guys to hear this because here we have Perry Stone. And then I'm going to show, this was shared with me on, on the forum. Then I was also shared a, a Washington Post article about Chuck Pierce. And then, you know, the one that we spoke about with um, Tom Horn. 
And all of these things, guys, each of the three, from three big characters, or, or I should say brothers that we know in Christ, whether you like them or don't like them, it, it doesn't matter. They're brothers in Christ. They know the Lord. All three of them have a time frame and something they received from the Lord, and they know their time, but they don't understand it. You see, listen, let's listen first to what, um, just for a second, a couple seconds here, what uh, Perry Stone has to say. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys heard that because he's in a real echoey room, but he said it, it was just a, a couple of days ago. See, this was this was posted yesterday, and I think it was just within the last couple of days. He had received from the Lord as he was getting up from a from his prayer and his in his thoughts, and he had heard not in his thoughts, not in his in his own self talk in his head, but he heard the day of reckoning is here. Well, we know, and he understands what the day of reckoning means. He said at first he didn't know, so he went to go look it up. And the term day of reckoning, this is what it means, and he talks about it as well. The time when past mistakes or misdeeds must be punished or paid for. A testing time when one's degree, uh, when, when the degree of one's success or failure must be revealed. Here's another one, day of reckoning, the time when one is called to account for one's actions, to pay one's debts, to fulfill one's promises and obligations. Hello, hello, that's the word Perry Stone received. It's not only about the virus, guys. We have understood that when the 14 years is about to begin, when the 70 years of Israel is over, this time would begin. We know that there's a period of escape, 40 to the 50, before the 14 years begins, and we've revealed it. Now Perry Stone is saying he received that word from the Lord that the day of reckoning is beginning. So if the day of the Lord is beginning, the, the reckoning of the day of the Lord is beginning, well, guess what? Tribulation is about to get started, right? We've understood that. But if we were to ask Perry Stone, Perry, how, how is it going to be the beginning of tribulation if the tribulation is only seven years? Because if the tribulation is only seven years, then by give or take 2027, 2026 to 2027, it should be over. But Christ never died in 26, 27. He died in 33. So what on earth would be missing? Perry Stone can't answer that, but he knows it's about to begin. You see? Now, how about this one? Watch this. This was shared yesterday on uh, on the forum, and it's from the Washington Post. I believe it was yesterday on the Washington Post. And it says, this is not the end of the world, according to Christians who study the end of the world. Well, um, first of all, for us here at Ministry Revealed, we never said it was the end of the world. We said it's the beginning of the end of days. You see, the tribulation is about to begin this is only the start of it and it will be a 14 year period of which six to seven for the gentiles and then the time of jacob's trouble for the jews and when it's all over and the lord's return there's still another thousand years you see so we're not talking about no end of the world yet for another thousand and fourteen years you see what i'm saying so they're just saying this because of course they don't understand but here's why they're saying it listen to this see it's just this little piece of the article right here Chuck Pierce, uh, Chuck Pierce's son was concerned, like a lot of people, looking out on a world of ransacked grocery stores and, uh, and canceled sports seasons and eerie lines of people standing six feet, six feet apart from one another. So he asked his dad, is this the end of the world? Okay, you guys know Chuck Pierce, right? He's an apostolic uh, preacher, right? Minister. And he says, uh, then it goes on to say, that's a question you can ask when you have a dad who calls himself an apostolic prophet and leads an apostolic ministry. Chuck Pierce said to his son, no, 
who is based in Corinth, Texas. Listen to what Chuck Pierce tells him. The Lord has shown me through 2026. So I know this isn't the end of time. Do you guys catch that? This was the biggest part right here. Chuck Pierce, who's an apostolic type of ministry, of which we have said the time of the apostolic age with a new group of apostles that we've been talking about for over a year that are going to be chosen, that are going to work during this time of seals that we call the foundation. Remember, those who will lay the foundation during seals that we said the Lord is going to choose again. We said that that group is going to work through seals. And what does he say being an apostolic type, whether he is or not, I don't know, but I could tell you the words he's using is pretty darn convincing. He's apostolic. And he said the Lord has shown him through 2026, but he says, so no, nah, it's not the end of the world yet, the way they're thinking it, right? Well, how does Chuck Pierce not realize that this is the beginning of the beginning, sorry, the beginning of the end of days, yet the Lord has shown him through to 2026? You guys understand? Why do we say through to the end of to, to 2026? What happens at that time, guys? Ministry revealed is proven that's the year of the rapture. The rapture. <laughs> we understood it, right? All of 20. So spring to spring, right? So all of 20, all of 21, all of 22, 23, 24, 25. That's year six to the end of 2025, which is the spring of 26. And then in 20. 26 is the seventh year of rest. What happens in that seventh year? 144,000 sealed and the rapture of the great multitude. You see, the Lord has shown them through to 2026, but I don't know what the Lord has shown them through to 2026. But we can tell you, just like Perry knows it's beginning because the Lord told him, Chunk is being shown that he's probably going to be working through to 2026 to the rapture. As the foundation layers... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, let me add this if I can to that, Alan. Um, there's also another minister uh, that considers himself an apostolic minister that I've, I've kind of you know, looked at his ministry over the years to hear what he's saying. And he seems to be a brother that over the years, you know, he's spoken the word of the Lord accurately. And his name, his ministry is White Dove Ministries. That's uh, you right. You have heard of that? Yeah. Uh, I think his name is Paul Keith Davis. And he fasted and prayed at the end of 2019. And he recently gave this word. You can find it on his website through White Dove Ministries. But he said the Lord told him that 2020 was the beginning of the apostolic age. And when I heard that, that really connected with me because of what we had seen through ministry revealed that um, as that time approaches, that that group from Smyrna, will be sent out so he's someone else that has kind of confirmed this same time yeah it's just amazing right and i think um i believe that was shared also in the forum a little over a month ago you know i had seen his um i had seen a, a little thumbnails of him or his wife uh in thumbnails for giving a talk and i hadn't really looked at it kind of like chuck pierce i hadn't looked at it but that one because it was shared through uh, the forum, I did listen to it and I thought, wow, you know, these guys and there's two of them now, one apostolic that the Lord's telling him it's coming now and the other one who's apostolic that's saying the Lord showed him through 2026 and then you got another one who's not apostolic and is priest saying, hey, the Lord told me this is the beginning. You know, it, it all of these things, guys. So we have Paul Keith Davis with White Dove Ministries. We have Perry Stone from the beginning. We have uh, uh, um, uh, Chuck Pierce. And then what do we have? Well, then we have Tom Horn. Tom Horn we spoke about just in the last uh, couple videos as well. He had a vision where he was taken up and he saw this, this, what looked like a dragon, the way it was waving going through the sky. And it turned out it was this meteor coming. And he heard the word, this name as he woke up for this meteor. And when he was shown it, he was shown that it was 2029 and it was for Wormwood. Well, we showed you guys that in the 14 year in the complete revelation, starting from this time frame 
of this springtime to June when it all begins, that in 2029 is the time frame of the third trumpet. The time frame of the third trumpet. And what's the third trumpet? Wormwood. You see, we have been given, guys, we have been given the revelation of the understanding. We know we're here. So let's take joy. Let's 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 settle our hearts and know that we're here. And then what we're now going to go into with our brother Richard here is he's going to help everybody settle your hearts even more. And if you're missing this piece, now I'm going to clarify too, or or yeah, I guess clarifying that do I think everybody needs to get rebaptized and do this all? No, 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 no. I know there are some out there. You know, I don't know if I had I had spoken to this to one of our sisters, Donna, directly, but I uh, I don't know if I said it publicly, but she said something in a comment on Facebook that she was baptized when she was like 13 or 14. I think it was 13. And she thought, you know, because of everything that had happened in her life since, that she thought, oh yeah, I need to I need to do a cleansing because of what I spoke about when I first spoke to our brother Richard uh, about three weeks ago and put it into a video a little bit. And a lot of people started getting baptized again and in the in the proper word of Jesus Christ and for the remission of sins. And so she thought she would do it again since she was only 13. And I thought, whoa, wait a second. It started, it started feeling it within me as well. But it wasn't because I felt I, 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 I hadn't repented. It wasn't because I felt I didn't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, it, it, I think it seems pretty obvious to most people. You know, I've repented. I, the, those sins are done. We might have these little things of frustration or anger along the way that we repent for as being in flesh and as humans, you know, we're just, we repent for those things and, to, and ask for the strength. But the, the sin, the, the big things that the Lord wants us to, that if we have the spirit in us, we shouldn't be doing. Well, those things I wasn't concerned about. However, remember what I said when Mila spoke about those people that were in heaven in the bigger area and they had black spots. And I thought, how was that possible? And it started really coming back to mind as I was speaking with Richard. And he started speaking about these things. And I realized that it was the dried blood covering over the sin that was coming, that came through repentance. And the father wouldn't be able to see it because it was covered by the blood on their robes in heaven. And I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. And then I realized why the Lord, like Richard said, was holding me, was holding him off and waiting till we got right towards this tail end to share the message with me privately first because I believe, and I believe Richard believes this, that I believe the Lord was speaking. He wanted me to get this corrected first. He didn't want me, nor do I believe he wants anybody listening to be in paradise. We have revealed the third heaven. And if we're going to go to the third heaven, our garments must be what? Do you guys remember what our garments must be? Let's get into this, and I'm going to bring this up right away. We all know it. We want a gorgeous robe, right, guys? See this Luke 23, verse 11? We are looking for a gorgeous, a radiant, magnificent, sumptuous in appearance, bright, clear, gorgeous, white robe this is what we are looking for we don't want just repentance we want it washed away and the receiving of the holy spirit and maybe somebody needs all three maybe somebody just needs another cleaning like i did because it had not be only because it had been so long but because i didn't do the right order i didn't when i got baptized as as, as rich is going to go into when I got baptized, I didn't do it with remission. There was no uh, repentance first. It was just, hey, get baptized. And I was on stage in the church and, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. You see, but there was no repentance. So I repented and later in life, after I had fallen away in the story you guys know about, I then repented and I had received the Holy Spirit, but I felt after our conversation that the Lord was, was on me because of my garment and he doesn't want me to stay or to to end up in in paradise 
He wants not only me, but he wants us in the third heaven. And that's what our brother is going to help clarify today. And as we see these scriptures, you guys are going to understand crystal clear, like you have come to understand the end time revelation. You're going to understand, if you haven't already, the, the difference between just repentance and the difference between repentance, the remission of sin with the old man dying and the new coming up, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's going to go into today. And for me, like I said, it was that middle one. It was that washing away. And for others, you might not need any of it. You might have just already recently covered this. You might have already done it. But it's speaking to those who, and I think it might be okay to speak to Peter about this, you know, speak about him on this, because we were speaking on Discord with a group yesterday. He had this sense as well. You know, he was baptized uh, 30 some years ago, he said, but he felt he had a lot of dirt that had come on since. Now, here's the thing that Richard will say. It doesn't matter if you were baptized 20 or 30 years ago. If you didn't fall into these sins and you had the spirit in you, well, guess what? You did the remission of, I mean, you did the repentance, the remission of sin and receiving the Holy Spirit. Then you wouldn't have gone into those sins. Right, the, the big sins, you know, with the, the fornication and the drunkenness and the, and the idolatry and all of those things, that wouldn't have come to you. So you don't have to worry about it. But if you're feeling this question, you're feeling this, oof, you know, I don't feel I'm like that anymore. You know, I, I have repentance. I have these things. Well, maybe if since you got baptized, you did fall into pornography you did fall into drunkenness and you did fall into idolatry of things and chasing women or whatever the case I'm just using as an example. You did fall into those things after you were baptized. Well, maybe you should be asking the Lord when this video is done and you've come to understand these things. Maybe you need to ask the Lord, Lord, please let, help me to understand. Do I need to clean my garment? Do I need to do this? You know, and see what the Lord tells you. Because if you're getting that sense like I had, I believe that word was for me. And I believe for some of you, maybe many of you, you'll sense that as well. And um, I'm telling you, when you finish, when we finish with this today, hearing our brother, I'm going to pretty much shut up. I'm going to jump in once in a while. But it's going to be our brother Richard here who's going to bring this home and uh, hopefully help bring it all home for us. All right. So with that, uh, brother Richard. You're up. All right. Let's go ahead and pull up that. There you go. There we go. That's good. Um, as we get into this, I'm going to I'm gonna just uh, ask the Lord for something here because yes. you know, everything, everything the ministry reveal does is out of the word and it's powerful and it's important. But we're about to talk to the gospel about the gospel. And the gospel message is, is the most powerful thing on this planet. It's the thing that changes our lives. So I'm just going to ask the Lord here to, to lead us in this. Father, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you right now, Father, specifically, Lord, just as you did in Luke 24 for the disciples, you open their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Father, we need this more than ever right now, Lord, for you to open our understanding. Father, like you said in your word, that this will penetrate into the joints and the marrow, Lord. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, allow this to happen, Father, so that in this time that we're in, Lord, that people will know that they know that they know that they, there's things they might need to do, Lord, or that they are truly born again. And Father, everything that we do, that, that we're doing today, Lord, may you receive glory from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's take a look here and start out with 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Uh, I'm going to read this because we do have it on screen. And then as we go along, we've got a lot of scriptures that we're going to try to cover. Because one thing is when, when I'm in front of people and I, I get to preach in the church, sometimes you only have one shot. And so you have to give a lot. Uh, but we're going to try to be uh, watching our time here so that we don't, you know, go too long. But we all know how our brother Allen is, so I don't think it'll be much of a problem. So We're good so for a little bit. 
First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in mem memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And I want to stop right there for a moment. You see that believed in vain? Mm -hmm. When you look that up in the Greek, it means idly, without reason or effect, without cause. And we even know from James chapter 2, verse 19, that the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. But where does that get them? So there are right. times that we believe in vain. We can be idle in our belief. We can have a head knowledge. But we're going to understand, and many of you do understand, that with the gospel, there's more to it than just having a head knowledge. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So here is where the Apostle Paul laid out to us the gospel. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose. And throughout Christianity, that is not controversial at all. That, that message is out there that that's what we believe as the gospel. That's right. That is our salvation. That's right. That is our gospel. The problem comes in is how do we accept that? What is our acceptance of this gospel? Well, when you look there in the middle, you see death, burial, resurrection. That's the part that Jesus actually did. He took on a death, he was buried, and he resurrected the third day. So we have to have a part in it, and a lot of times throughout many churches and, and across Christianity, a lot of people have this, this thought that all we have to do is believe that, and we're good at it. Just believe it. And I like to tell people this. Throughout this time, I'm going to tell a few stories because I like I like visuals to get people's attention. Mm -hmm. Let's say for a moment that you were in a third world country and you were visiting a village that didn't know that electricity exists. And you were able to take one of the village elders with you to a location where there was actually electricity. And you were sitting in a dark room and you mentioned to that that elder, that if they went over and put that light switch, that light would come in the room. Well, for someone that had never seen that, that would be hard to believe, right? That's right. Well, what would be something that would tell us that that person believed that? Well, yeah. probably if they went up and put the light switch that's on, right. right? Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's kind of the same way for us. You know, we hear this thing about works, 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 whether well, it's not, you know, I don't have to do anything for my salvation, that it's through grace. Well, that's true in the event that of, of us understanding that Jesus came and died. That's grace. He came and died for us on the cross. That was his grace. So if you look here, we're going to understand in these few minutes that we have here, we're going to get to a lot of scripture that's going to help us with this, that our part of this is that if Jesus died, he asked us to die to ourselves. And we're going to find out that that's what the word repent actually means. A lot of people think that repent means that we just need to change our mind. And we're going to get the Greek of that and change our mind towards what we think about God. No, that actually means we need to change our mind. And as, as uh, it was one thing that uh, Alan had actually mentioned in our conversation, that he likes to look at it this way. You do a 180 degree turn. You're walking away from God in your sin. And when you repent and change your mind, you turn and go the other way towards God. But there's something in that about our sin. Because remember, what did Jesus come here to save us from? Sin. Our sin, that's right. He came to save us from our sin. All right, so here we go. We, we repent. And then here's the other thing. If repentance... And you'll see this in a little bit a lot clearer, but just to give you an overview here. If repentance is our death to ourself, to our sin, it's the crucifixion of our flesh. Because remember on the cross, 
Jesus died a physical death, right? Mm -hmm. He was crucified a physical death. And so for us, we don't have to die that physical death. We just have to go to him and embrace his death and what he did. But he asked us, be willing to lay down your life. That's be right. willing to turn from your ways and lay it down, and you're going to find out that that's actually what repentance is. Now, here's the, the next step. When Jesus died, they put his, his body in a tomb. Well, if you die to yourself, we're just not going to leave you dead. Your next step is burial. Mm -hmm. We're going to bury your body in a typical grave. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find out through, through Colossians and Romans what actually happens is you're actually being spiritually circumcised. Your heart is being circumcised. You're, you're even told in Ezekiel 36 that you're given a new heart. That heart of stone is taken and you're given a heart of flesh. That's a circumcision. <laughs> That's you're right. going to see a picture of this. You're going to see a picture that when I repent, when I'm willing to lay down my life and turn away and get in that water, and, and here's what happens, and you're going to see this from Scripture in just a few moments. You are buried with Christ. So what he did 2,000 years ago, when you do this by faith, you're being buried with him. And then we're going to see that even through that, that people have this thing where they get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, yes. because of Matthew 28, 19. But also, when you go and look at Scripture, there's nowhere in Scripture that anybody, it was ever recorded that anybody was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every time a water baptism took place, especially in the book of Acts, mm -hmm. they were baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of their, of their sins. And you're going to see that. But then, we can't leave you dead and buried. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a resurrection. And that resurrection, just like Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus was raised by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, we get raised the same way. We receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's right. And, and, I, and again, I'm just giving you a quick overview. Yeah. So the second part of that is the repent, be baptized, receive. That's our part. Yeah. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in there. People argue a lot about, well, Brother Richard, that's works. That's me working. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> if, if, if works is me doing something, how is it a work when I stop sinning? Yeah. Me? How can I be doing a work when I stop something? That don't yeah. make sense to me. Just like they gave so, Jesus so, trouble when he, was, uh, when he was healing people on, on the Sabbath. You know, you, you have that right. same type of thing. You know, on the Sabbath, oh, you shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be doing it. They, you know, they're looking at it as works and works. Well, you know, I, I, in my mind, I just see it a little bit of the same. You know, it's, yeah. it's not, a, it's, it's not the same, and it's not something that's frowned upon on the Sabbath when you're doing a healing. It's like being baptized on the Sabbath. You know, you're, you're not going to be in trouble for being baptized on the Sabbath. It's not a work, right? Right. So. Our part, again, is repent, be baptized, receive. And, and, and we'll look here at Acts 2.38, and like I said, we're going to expound upon this. Mm -hmm. But this is, remember, just to take this in context, this is when the Holy Ghost had come on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' 40 days, after the 10 days that they were told to wait for the promise. That's right. The Holy Ghost was poured out. They received it, and as soon as they did, Peter began to preach. That's right. People begin to ask questions, and right before this, in Acts two thirty, before Acts two thirty eight, they ask him, "What must we do?" And this was Peter's response, verse thirty eight. Then Peter said unto them, "Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost." And, and you know what's so interesting we, there? Right. I'm just going to jump in real quick. You see that it's comma and, so it's repent, comma and be baptized for the remission of sins. And then you have comma and you shall receive the whole, the gift. You see, it's the same thing. There's three divisions. It's not like some people might think all of it is covered in one. There's three separate things. 
It's just, I don't know if you had seen the video we did called the comma and video. Um, it was, it was maybe a year ago or something like that. And it was the video called, literally called comma and. And it reveals that things are added together, but with the comma and the and, it's a separation and add this. A separation and add this. Like in, um, in Daniel, you know, uh, uh, seven weeks, comma, and three score and two. Or we go in, in Revelation chapter seven, and it says those that had white robes, comma, and those that had palms in their hands. The difference is they're not the same group of people. They are two separate groups of people in that case. Those that have white robes and those that had the palms in their, ha the palms in their hands, they're there together, but they're two separate things. And that's what this is telling me here with repent, comma, and be baptized, comma, and you shall receive the gift. There are three things to be done together. Yes, that's an excellent point, Alan. And in this overview we're giving right here, you're going to understand that a lot more because we're going to go through each one of these individually. Yes. And that's going to prove Alan's point here. So... Um, just wanted to give you this overview to understand, and we will refer back to this as we go on. But mm -hmm. I do want to make mention to this. We've got to realize something here that, and I'll ask Alan this question. He can answer this. When did the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection actually, be, when was it initiated? At Pentecost. That's exactly right. Yeah. Jesus had to be had to die, be buried, and resurrected. That's right. And so after his forty day period, then the ten days came, the gospel was now there and it was being fulfilled. And so we find that in Acts chapter two. Yeah. And so if we want to know what people did to receive the gospel, why do most churches steer away from the book of Acts? Exactly. That's where you find the gospel in action. And, and you know so that's where we have yeah, I, I was going to say, it's a lot of like what we talk about, right? When, like you had said, one of the, I think one of the first videos you saw with us, when you just said, wow, that's what it is, when you understood that Matthew is speaking to the Jews, Mark is speaking to another group, which is the church left behind, and Luke is speaking to another group, which is the, the bride, it was a confirmation for you and what you grew up in with the with the Baptist church, right? being told that no it's father son and holy spirit and why were they teaching from that why is that their doctrine because everybody's being taught from matthew as if mark and luke are essentially saying the same thing not realizing that it's different groups speaking to different people at different times and that if we follow with what luke said we should be there in acts not speaking to something that's for the jews and i know you had said that in the past and that really that was something that really caught your attention when you started, when you came across and started watching Ministry Revealed. And, you know, you, you, it becomes so clear. And I wanted to bring it up because the people here in this ministry who understand the different Gospels, they will understand, well, wait a second. Yeah, that's right. That's in Matthew. That's only spoken of in Matthew like that. Everywhere else, it's speaking of Jesus' name. So there's something else going on. And if it's in Matthew 28, well, guess what? That's not for us, nor was it ever for us, and it's for the end, especially. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to throw that in because a lot of us here would recognize that because we understand who the Gospels are speaking to, and we know Luke is the one speaking into Acts as well. So, Sure, and, and, and you're exactly right. Me being an, a now an apostolic-type minister, I, I was raised Baptist, and I grew up pastoring... Uh, Baptist churches, mm -hmm. and then later I went into full-time mission work, but I became more of an apostolic minister, which just means basically I follow the doctrine of the apostles, what they That's teach right. I follow, just like we're all supposed to, yeah. but, but Alan's right in the fact that with me understanding about the importance of water baptism, and then understanding that why did they do it in the name of Jesus? Yeah. And so when I got that understanding, and then I came to Ministry Revealed last summer, and I saw him teaching on the Gospels, like he said, and I saw, well, wait a minute. There it is right there. It's in Matthew. So why should I have been, though, here as, as a uh, early young man growing up in the church following Matthew, 
-hmm. instead of the other the other gospel luke but then also finding in the book of acts it wasn't like matthew it was in the name of jesus and you're going to understand as we go a little further on in this that it's not about what you say or what is said over you in the water it's actually what you understand you're doing and we're going to get into that a lot deeper in a lot more detail here in a few minutes perfect um what I'd like to do right now is I want to give just a little bit of this understanding. If you would, uh, Alan, go to Luke chapter 1, uh, I'll bring verse 76. Up, okay, I'll bring up Esort here for you to see. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so to go to where, sorry? Luke verse uh, chapter 1, verse 76. And, and what I want to point out here is years ago when I received this understanding from the Lord, the way he gave it to me was understanding through John the Baptist. And so just for a moment to get a little history, John the Baptist here as a child that was just born was prophesied over by his father, Zechariah. Mm -hmm. And I want you to see what was said about him. That We need to understand this. This is something that I try to get all believers to really understand this. Uh, verse 76, since you brought it up, I'll just read it. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. So that's, that's Zechariah prophesying over John the Baptist. And listen to what he says. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Mm -hmm. So even saying that, that, I just get chills because... John was given the knowledge of salvation. That's right. All right. We need to know that. And it was through remission of sins. That's right. That's very, very, very important for us to understand. Now, you don't have to go there, Alan. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to try to get this so, so we can do it for time's sake here. Um, in Luke 3.3, 3, you'll find out what John preached. He preached the baptism for the remission of sins. You'll find it in... Uh, Seven nine. Mm -hmm. um, look at there it is right there. He preached yeah. the baptism, uh, repentance for the remission of sins. Uh, go if you would to verse seven. Yeah. Then he said to the multitude of the king to be baptized of him. Here's where he. he this is something I throw in there that we got to understand. This was a section right here where he actually turned some Pharisees away from being baptized. Mm -hmm. Now, if you did that in church today, <laughs> yeah. you would probably be voted out the very next week. That's but right. John would not baptize someone unless they had fruits worthy of repentance. Mm -hmm. And so here's where we can get that understanding that, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I heard Alan say a few minutes ago in the intro that if you didn't really repent, but you got baptized, well... Brother Richard's going to add here that more than likely all you got was get wet. That's right. That's because right. you got to have repentance before water baptism to have a remission. And if we go to that word, look, if you would, Alan, pull up that word uh, remission there. In the Greek. Freedom, pardon, there deliverance. Forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness. All right, there it is right there. There's our remission. There's your freedom, your pardon. And so, so let me state this right here so that we'll be clear. All right? Mm -hmm. People think when you're teaching on this kind of thing that, well, wait a minute, you're diminishing the blood of Jesus. No, we're about to get there because without Jesus to shed blood, there is no remission. Mm -hmm. and what you're going to see, too, is that you need the water baptism for remission. We're going to couple those things just like John the Baptist did so that we can get a full understanding of it. It, now, goes, it goes to like we were saying, you know, even a little earlier. It's that it's the difference between just repentance and being able to go to the kingdom of God, but in paradise. It's almost yeah. like there's a difference there, right? We're not, this is what we're talking about here, guys. We're not looking to go to paradise. We're looking to go to the third heaven. I want to remind people of that. That's the difference between just repentance compared to the remission and receiving as well that follows the repentance. And that's the difference between just saying, I believe and I ask for forgiveness. And you're going to see as we keep going and as he goes into it, 
uh, you'll get into John chapter three, and that's just it, it's it's so crystal clear. Yes, yes. So, so understanding that John had the knowledge of salvation, and it was through the repentance and the remission of our sins, and that was his message. John preached a baptism of repentance for remission of sins, and if you didn't show works worthy of repentance, John didn't baptize you. All right. That's right. So, so going further to understand, this is something else. If you would go to John chapter 1, verse 29, the Gospel of John. All right, very important to understand this. This is, there's, there's two major things, and all of you that are listening to this today, please. I know a lot of times it's hard to remember Scripture and, and different things, but please remember this. This is something that you need a foundation of this. John the Baptist was baptizing people, and it said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Please understand that that's something that John the Baptist announced. That's something that he knew. And the scripture goes on and says, This is he of whom said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode, and one more scripture upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So get this picture in your mind. John said two things about Jesus. He's coming to take away the sin of the world, and he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Those are two very important things. So here's my question to people every day when I minister to people and they have questions. If John said Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, we want that, right? Mm -hmm. Of course we do. That's right. If he said Jesus came to baptize us with the Holy Ghost, well, that's no less important than taking away the sin. That's right. Because Jesus came to do it. Yeah. He came to do those two things. Now, what we want to do is we want to understand, okay, if Jesus came to take away the sin of the world and he came to baptize us with the Holy Ghost, how for sure do we get the sin taken away? That's what we got to know. We got to know that first. Well, again, John preached repentance and remission of sins, mm -hmm. and his remission of sins came through water baptism. It's crystal clear when you look at the story of John the Baptist and what he was preaching and, and what he was doing. Mm -hmm. so, so for us, our acceptance is not only believing this, but you have to follow through with it. Yes. That's not a work. That is putting, that's, you know, James talks about you know, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith with works. Yeah. Well, but this is not a work. This is us following through with what Jesus said so that we can have a true repentance, a true remission of sins. Yeah. So We've, It's like you've only done one part of the things that he said. To have this done, do this, this, this. Right. It is, it's nothing to do with works. It's nothing to do with then now go off and do this, and now go off and do that, and now go off. No, it's just... Here's what you do, and everybody just, well, not everybody, but most people would say, okay, well, I've, I've done this. Well, no, 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 there, there's the other two things that complete the thing that I'm asking you to do. That's right. So yeah. if you would, Alan, go to Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and while you're getting there, I want to start explaining the word repent. It's, the Greek word is metanoia, and it's the strong number is G3340. And it means to think differently or afterward, to change your mind, change the inner man. Mm -hmm. So, so we've, got to, we've got to gain this understanding that repentance, especially, for example, in the Old Testament, when you find the word repent mm -hmm. and you do the root search of repent, it means to turn back. Yeah. Turn back because the, 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 people, the children of Israel 
were with God at one point, and they turned away. And so they were called to repentance, which meant to turn back. That's right. So when I'm when I'm preaching in churches, I like to a lot of times if I'm up on the stage, I'll start walking one to one side, maybe to the left, and I'll say, "Look, when I change my mind and repent, I turn and go the other way." And this is this is another example I use for people to help them understand. When Alan and I decided to do this little video together and uh, to get this understanding to get more ministry revealed when it comes to repentance and remission of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit, when when I agreed to do this with Alan, I could have called Alan and said, hey, brother, I've had a change of mind. And mm-hmm. he, said, he would say, okay, well, would I be here doing this video right now? No. 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 <laughs> Why? Because every time you change your mind, it results in a change of action. That's right. So if I repent and I, and I turn away from my sin, it will re- result in a change of action. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see how God doesn't just leave that up to us. He gives us help uh, in doing that. So we've got to understand that this repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of heart. So it's like this. Uh, here's another little uh, example that you can go by. If, if you had this great job that you really loved and, and, and it was just the best job you ever had, and all of a sudden a new one came along, and it, it, it even looked better and it paid more and it had better benefits, and you said, oh, I want that one, you would have to lay your first job down, right? That's right, yeah. To take up the next one. Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of what repentance is about. Repentance is about laying something down and turning to Christ. Laying it down. Jesus laid his life down for us. And here's a here's a point to understand, because Alan's been teaching on the bride. My Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, deserves a spotless bride. He deserves it. That's what he's coming for. He's going to be given that spotless bride, and he's very deserving of it. And I'm going to just throw this in here. This was further down. I was going to talk about this later, but this is a good point to, to understand this right now. I shared this with Alan uh, a while back when we were talking one night. I remember preaching to a church one Easter Sunday, and I didn't have a message to give. I prayed and asked the Lord, and he never gave me one. And it was an unusual situation to where I stepped up to the pulpit, and I still didn't have that message. And as soon as I laid my Bible down on the pulpit and looked out at the congregation and, and kind of introduced myself, a question fell into my spirit. And that question was, how many of you out there have children? Of course, most of the people raised their hand, and I asked, have you ever disciplined your child? Of course, everybody raised their hand. And I said, why did you discipline your child? And they kind of looked around, and they looked at me, and I said, look, I would really like somebody to answer if they're willing to. I said, don't be afraid. Just just answer the question. And somebody said, well, I did it so they wouldn't do it anymore. And I said, so in essence, you, you disciplined them so they would change their mind about what they had done. And they said, yeah, that's exactly why I disciplined them. If, if, if the law, say for speeding, for example, if the law is a certain speed limit and you go over and you get caught, why do they, why do they invoke a fine upon you? Is it because they, they want to make a lot of money? They're trying to get you to change your mind about the speed limit. That's right. So it all it all works around changing your mind. And so I want to, I want to give you this picture. Jesus Christ on the way to the cross was beaten. He was beaten almost to death. And that whole time he was taking your discipline. He was taking my discipline for the sins that, that were of the world, the sins that we would commit in our lives. He was taking it on himself. And he went all the way to that cross and died and took a final, ultimate discipline for you. And here's my question today, because we got to understand this with repentance. Did Jesus do all of that so that we would continue sinning? No, of course not. Those are questions to ask, because we're going to have some scriptures here in a minute that's going to answer that for us. That's right. And I'll, I'll, is, I was just going to say, I'll jump in with one real quick. I mean, we talked about this the other day, and I... I've talked about how in videos, when I when I was reading it, I would say, well, what did, why did it say, and in, in now sin no more? I'm like, who, it must be speaking just in end times, 
Because how is it that people can sin no more? I mean, we're still in the flesh. So what's it talking about? And this is what you're getting at, right? It's we'll, yeah. we'll understand that. Yeah, we're keeping the, those other sins just won't enter us anymore because we've got the spirit. But, you know, yeah, you're going to have the little frustrations and these little things here and there that, you know, we'll catch and we'll repent and ask the Lord to forgive us for for those things that we're doing. But that, the, the real sin of what the Lord was speaking about, that that just doesn't come anymore. And that is what he meant by go and sin no more, right? That's right. And, and, and again, what Alan's talking about right now, there's going to be some scriptures that we're going to bring up. That's right. And, and the reason we're kind of painting this picture is so that you'll have a picture in your mind when you see the word and you hear the scriptures and the spirit can, can penetrate into you that understanding that we're trying to bring out here. So it's very, very important to, to gain this understanding. Were you at Mark? Let's see, Mark 115, yes. All right. Remember, John the Baptist came preaching a message of repentance for the remission of sin, a, a baptism of repentance. And here in Mark 115, it says in saying, now this is Jesus saying, uh, it says, uh, let me go back to 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now listen to what Jesus says here. Very important. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Well, sometimes, somehow over the centuries, we've gotten this understanding that you've got to believe the gospel first. Mm -hmm. Is that what Jesus said there? No. No. Jesus said you need to be willing to repent. You need to be willing to lay it down. Mm-hmm. Comma and That's right. believe the God. That's right. Do you see that? Yeah. It's very important. So repentance is there when the Spirit is convicting us. Our first obligation is like back. We don't have to go back there, but back to our first screen. Mm -hmm. when, when that happened to the people when Peter was preaching, he said, repent. He didn't say, well, you got to believe. He said, if you're being convicted, then be willing to turn. Repent and be baptized. And so we got to have that understanding as we're going forward in this. Mm -hmm. Now, Alan brought up a, a good point a while ago, and we're going to look at a few of those scriptures. Um, you would go to John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is where oh, Jesus yes. had healed, had healed a man. And after he healed him, he found him. It says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Now, I personally believe that this is Jesus' definition for us of repentance. And also, I pointed this out to Alan the other day. Look at what it says. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Yes. So in this guy's case, he had something come upon him because of what? He sinned sin. some more. Yeah. See, so if he, if he now is healed... If he goes out and sins, a worse thing's going to come upon him. So that's just a little point. All sin, I mean, all sickness isn't caused necessarily because of your sin. I want you to know that, but here's a case where it was. Yeah. So I want us to understand that that, that that can happen. But here's the bigger picture. Sin no more. That's right. Sin and, no more. And I account for it in, in my life, too. A lot. Everybody here pretty much knows my story. But when I had that, Excuse me, it was 10 years later, and then I started going into sinning more, and what happened? It was worse than I had ever had before. I got worse into the drinking. I got worse into everything, right? I ended up coming back to sinning like it happened here, and it was worse than the last time. So, I, I get that for sure. All right, there's another place. We're not going to go there right now for time's sake, but, but John chapter 8, verse 11 was told there, the, the woman that was yes. caught in adultery, that's the famous uh, ch chapter of John in Ministry Revealed. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll jump out on that one too, because a lot of people are saying, oh, but we, we see everything in end time eyes, right? Well, yes, we see everything in end time eyes, but we're not talking about seeing in end time eyes right now. We're talking yes. about in the now, right? We know everything is past, present, and future, and Ministry Revealed is about seeing the future but we are now in the present so that we can be part of that future from above, not here experiencing it. 
And that's a great point because Ellen and I had talked about this, and I actually asked Ellen uh, some, to do something mm -hmm. because he, he receiving what he receives through the end time ministry, Ellen was tending to look at everything through those end time lens. Mm -hmm. But we have to step back sometimes and remember that in Scripture, what was and is and is to come. That's right. So take, taking a point from Alan, when I look at Acts chapter 1 and 2, 1.0, mm -hmm. that's still valid for right now. That's right. That's right. Acts chapter 1 and 2, 2.0 is about to happen. Exactly. So this is a good point for us to understand is we can get absorbed to the point where we're looking at everything toward the end but we're living in the here and now and we've got to we, it's just like what now what's being brought up now about the garments and the garments need to be clean that's right that's for now that's not an end time thing that's right that is for us now so it's a now point. so yeah exactly and you know it, it it also um shoot i hate when i had a little lost my train of thought uh, uh, um well, I'll come back to it later. It's it's come and gone two or three times now, so that's okay. We'll keep going. Okay, pick it back up. It'll, it'll come to you. Let's go now. Let's go now. We're going to spend a few minutes here. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Okay. And we're going to end up kind of going all the way down through about verse 23. But this, to me, is one of the best passages that Paul really lays out our understanding of how we deal with sin. Okay, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Let's start at verse 1. Oh, verse 1, okay. Down to the end of verse 1. All right, listen to what Paul says here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? All right, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Shall we keep living a life of sin that God's grace just keeps abounding upon us? He says, God forbid. Mm -hmm. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. You see that? Mm -hmm. Right now, there's nothing more crystal clear than that. Mm -hmm. So where do we get our being dead from sin? All right now, I'm going to throw this in here right now because this is very important. I'm going to give you another picture to go by. I want you to picture a man standing out in your yard or outside where you are under a big umbrella. And it's pouring down rain, and that man's standing out there, and he's just as dry as he can be. And you're outside, and you're getting soaking wet. And that man beckons to you to come over to his umbrella, and so you walk over, and you get under his umbrella, and all of a sudden, you're not getting wet anymore. All right, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint this picture because you're going to see this in these scriptures as we go down through here. This is a picture of Jesus having died on the cross and been buried in robes, and Jesus beckons to you, Come over here and get under my umbrella. Mm -hmm. Come over here and embrace what I did for you. You don't have to physically die. You just need to lay down everything and come over here and embrace my death and burial. Mm -hmm. All right, now keep that picture in your mind as we go through these scriptures. That is our death. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. So now watch this. You've embraced the death of Jesus through your repentance. You're willing to lay down your life and embrace it. And right here it says, when we get baptized into Jesus Christ, we are baptized into his death. Now, anybody out there listening to me and hearing this voice, if you had a belief that water baptism doesn't really mean anything, there is no other way to be buried with Christ than water baptism. Absolutely no other way. It, you know, look, I'm not going to argue with people over whether whether they you have to be baptized to be saved. All I do is give the scriptures and say, look, this is what he said, that we are to be baptized into Jesus Christ, and we're baptized into his death. Then look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now notice on, on Brother Allen's uh, Esau here, look at how he's got this marked up. You think he's been going through this? <laughs> Very important. Very important. So we are buried with him 
my baptism into the dead. All right, I'm going to skip down uh, for time's sake to a few more of these scriptures. Um, let's see here as Brother Allen kind of brings them down for us. Um, let's see. All right, let's stop right there. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. See? Mm -hmm. We were crucified with him through our repentance into his death. Yeah, it's pretty crystal clear. <laughs> it's crystal clear that the body of sin might be what? With an uh oh here. This is an uh oh moment. So the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That's right. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So here's what I want you to see about that picture we painted of the umbrella. And we're going to see this, if you would, go on down a little bit uh, to verse 10 and 11. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now watch this. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in its lust, in the lust thereof. Neither yield your, your members to righteousness as righteous instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. So back to the umbrella. When you embrace the death of Christ through your repentance, and you are buried with Christ in that typical grave of water, sin at that moment has no dominion over you. Mm -hmm. It used to. It used to. Yes, we're not saying that sin will never tempt you, but remember, now it doesn't have the power over you. It doesn't have the dominion. You can say no to it where you might not could have said no no to it before you entered into the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. So this is a powerful understanding. And what we want people to know is there's something that God does that's supernatural. When you repent and embrace his death and enter into his death by your burial in water and unite with him, uh, I think it's uh, Colossians chapter 2 tells us we're circumcised. Our heart is circumcised. Yes. Yeah. All right? The cutting, the cutting away of the body of sin. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, people start thinking here, well, wait a minute. You now I see that that's supposed to happen, but wait a minute. Does that make us perfect? No. No. You still live in this fleshly body, but what happens is sin doesn't have a dominion now. So as Alan right. stated earlier, you don't continue living that life of sin, but it doesn't mean that you won't might not ever make a mistake. You might have a wrong attitude or this or that. And I'm going to explain that a little further, just a little bit further down, so that we can get a greater understanding of that. But we've got to see this that's being spoken up here um, in Romans chapter 6. And I would advise everyone, please go study Romans 6, 1, 2, 1 through 23, uh, and get this understanding now. Let me throw this in here. Here's another quick little story. Many people may remember this this gentleman. Um, he was a, a, a scholar of the Word, a great man of God over the years. People may not have agreed with, with all of his teachings, but I gleaned, and I, I ate the meat out of the ministry that I heard from him years ago. And he told this story. I'm giving him, 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 him the accolades for this story. I wish I had come up with it, but I didn't. His name was uh, Brother Derek Prince. He's, he's passed away. But this is what Brother Derek said about repentance. And I promise you, when I tell you this story, you'll never forget it. There was a man that was in his home on a Sunday morning. And he was down in his man cave. And his wife came down and asked him, Honey, do you want to go to church with us? And he said, No, I'm just going to stay here. Well, when she came down, he just happened to be drinking a little cup of whiskey. And he was smoking a big cigar, and he was actually watching a, a, a not-so-good movie. And so his wife left. And when she returned after church, she came come down into the man cave, and she noticed that 
the movie was still playing, but he wasn't watching it. His head was slumped down, and the cigar was in the ashtray, and it was smoking, and the little little thing of whiskey was sitting over there, but he wasn't drinking it. And what had happened while she was gone is he actually had a heart attack and passed away. But that's not my point to the story. My point to this story is he wasn't smoking, drinking, or watching Phil because he was dead to it. That's right. <laughs> he was it? no longer drinking, smoking. He or, was that's no right. longer because he was dead. Yeah. Well, we just got through reading that Paul asked us, told us to reckon ourselves as dead indeed to sin. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is we're going to see as we go on that we're not left alone in this. God gives us something that makes this possible. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this should start to dispel something in your mind. See, most people want to think that Christ only came to die on the cross to forgive sins. No, 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 no. Christ came to destroy it. He That's wanted right. it out of your life. He, as a matter of fact, we'll find that over in 1 John, where Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And we'll see that that is sin. So it's a great understanding to get this. You may still be thinking, well, wait a minute, how is all this possible? I see it. Well, we're getting there. We're, we're getting to that point. Um, while we're here, let me throw in another quick little story, because this is one Alan and I talked about that I think really kind of got his attention and put a lot of thought into this. Where you're sitting right now in your home or wherever you're listening to this, I'm sitting here at a desk, and I have a little speck of dirt or a little stain on my desk here. I want you to think about if you went and got a vial of blood, and we all know what blood looks like. It's thick. You can't see through it. It's, it's opaque. You can't see through blood. And so if I poured that blood on the stain, would I be able to see the stain? Nope. Of course not. Because you can't see through blood. So imagine this is what happens when we repent and turn to God immediately upon our repentance. The blood of Jesus supernaturally is applied to your life. It is applied. That's right. So that God can no longer see your sin. It's called atonement. He atones for your sin. And what happens with that blood, it's kind of like a cleansing agent. It's kind of like what you might call mean green or something. When you spray it on the these spots and grease, it goes to work and it starts breaking it down. Well, that's what the blood does. And isn't... But, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. But, do we want just those spots and those stains left there just being covered with blood? By the blood? Even spiritually? No, because what happens is, even though those sins are cleansed, we still wear that around on our bodies. That's right. And so along comes remission of sins. Step two. Along comes water baptism. Along comes us being buried with Christ. So so picture your little spot there on your desk and that cleansing agent getting down into it and all of a sudden you get it with a bucket of water. Mm -hmm. Washed away. That's right. Washed away. Forgiveness of sins. Remission of sins. And so we start to get this picture, and we go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You mean to tell me God uses water? Oh, well, yeah, we're going to see that in Scripture also very clearly uh, as we go on into water baptism. So so one thing I want Alan to run to right quick is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews 10, 26. Okay, Scripture says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay, if we have received this knowledge of the truth, and we go on in through life, and we get born again like we're supposed to, do you see what it says about willful sin? Mm -hmm. That's right. Willful sin? We're not talking about making a mistake here. We're talking about continuing to do things willfully that you know that are wrong. You see what that says? Mm -hmm. No more sacrifice for sin. That's right. All right? 
But what we have to understand in this teaching, and, and, and if we go look over in, in 1 John chapter 3, we'll find that once we get born again, and once we get washed, and once we get filled with the Spirit, here's what happens to us. The Bible says that if we're going along and we do sin, it says if you sin. It doesn't say when you sin. It says if you sin. Mm -hmm. Here's what happens to us. That's right. If we sin, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, he's our advocate. That's right. And if we confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Right now, here's what I want people to understand in this. I want us to see this. When this happens, we're not talking about repentance. Because remember, we've already changed our mind. Yes. We're living in this place where we're reckoning ourselves as dead and deep to sin, like Paul said. Mm -hmm. But if we take on a wrong attitude or we do something and the Spirit convicts us, we're not told to repent. We're told to confess it. Oh, because okay. we're living that life of repentance. You follow me? That's right, yeah. So here's what, here's what we're called to do. Once we have repented and turned to God and received all this that we're talking about, then our responsibility is to die daily. Yes. Die to ourselves daily. That's different than repentance. That's that's when I wake up in the morning, I reckon myself as dead and deep to sin, and I go about my life. Mm -hmm. If I do encounter a situation where I have a wrong attitude or whatever, something that I'm not set out to go do, yeah. and it happens, I confess it to the Father, and He's faithful and just to forgive it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm now entered into that life, that Christian life, that walking in the Spirit. Those are the things that we're trying to help people understand here. That's right. And it brings clarity even to some of the things that I was saying before. You know, because I was saying, like I said earlier, how about, what do you mean sin no more? You know, I would talk about repentance and saying, you know, guys, you need to repent. And really what it is, is we needed this clarity. You know, it wasn't just repentance. If we've repented, we've already got it. You know, we've got the remission. We needed to understand these things more clearly. And maybe people are understanding and starting to see more now why I wanted Richard to come on. You know, it's not just, we're, we're getting a, a much greater understanding. I know I am. And if I am, I know others are because I've spoken to some as well. That we're getting this much more clearly from somebody who understands it much greater than us and who's traveled the world telling and revealing and giving it to people and 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 baptizing them and all of these things that come with it. And this is what Richard's doing for us here. Okay, let's run really quick to John chapter 3. This is where it's going to get really, really hairy. This is where it gets crystal because, clear. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but people are going to go, uh-oh, whoa. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize this. Uh, first John chapter 3. Oh, first John, okay. First John, yeah, then we're going to go there. <laughs> we're going to go there next. Okay. First John chapter three. Let's start at yeah. We'll start at verse one. Uh, let's see. No, I didn't want to start there. Let me go down a little further. Let's go down to uh. Let's see. Yeah. Let's stop at three. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So here the scripture is telling us we need to purify ourselves. Mm-hmm. All right, there's an understanding in that. There it is, what make clean. Of, uh, there, there it is, there it is right there, to make clean. That's us in our repentance, dying to our flesh, dying to ourselves, because we have entered into this covenant with Christ through his death and his burial and his resurrection. All right, is, let's keep going. And, and the purifying here, isn't this the, this is where it's remission, isn't it? It's now making clean, not covering. Yes, yes, this is where... This is where that understanding that we're giving here, we're being purified by all this. It's making clean. Perfect. All right, look at, look at says, well, verse 4, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Right. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a question for everyone right here. He didn't say he was manifested to forgive them. That's right. Take away. Yes. Take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Uh-oh. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> Uh-oh. There it is again. 
whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> the devil. This will put a lot of people in, in a in a nervous position right now. <laughs> sure. For the devil sent it from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. <laughs> Another uh-oh. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, let me clarify something. Yeah, this is definitely when I was talking about it with the end time eyes saying, see, there was no way this was for now. This must be something speaking of the end to a certain group. <laughs> okay, but think about this. Now, this has nothing to do with end times. This That's is right. Now, this is is. This has been since Jesus died on the cross. That's right. But here's our understanding. This is understanding. If we truly embrace Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection, like we're talking about here, now if we just say we believe it and go on about our business, no, of course not. Yeah. We're going to live in sin because we live in this body of sin. Mm -hmm. But what happens is when we embrace what we're discussing here and we apply it to our lives like Jesus wants us to, what happens to us is we get basically a cleansing a washing, and we're going to see that here in a few minutes, uh, clearly from Scripture. And we get the power of the Holy Spirit and all of those things coming together. And we're going to see how they come together here in Scripture in a second. But when we get all of that, all of a sudden we realize, oh my goodness, my life of sin is not there anymore. I don't even want to live in sin. But again, as I go through this life, it doesn't mean I'll never make a mistake. Exactly. But I'm not living that life of sin any longer. That's right. Because I've, I'm, I've united with his death. I've got the blood applied. Yeah. I've been buried with him through baptism. I've had that circumcision of my heart. And we're going to learn in a few minutes. I've received the gift of holiness and righteousness, which is the Holy Ghost. Yeah, how could you go on and, you know, go hit the clubs and try to pick up girls and, you exactly. know, do all that? If the Holy Spirit is in you, there is no exactly. way your spirit is going to want to do that anymore. That's exactly right. And so this is what's being pointed out to us here. So understand this. And that last part there, uh, it says, And he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children, uh, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth doth not righteous, righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his mother. All right. So the understanding here is just like we've been saying. You have to see the full picture. I have a brother that I told uh, Brother Allen about, a good brother of mine, very trusted brother, prophetic brother. He talks about the, the death, burial, and resurrection, and our repentance, baptism, and receiving as being the whole enchilada. Mm -hmm. The whole enchilada, just getting it all. A lot of people want to teach just the repentance part to where that I get the blood applied. Yeah. But wait a minute, Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, and he does that through repentance and water baptism. That's and, how the sin gets taken away. That's right. And you know, that's where I was just going to jump in from the last thought that I had before, was when you when you when we see all this, just like we showed, you know, we can understand because we know now who the gospels are speaking to, and we know that everybody is generally taught ninety plus percent of the time from Matthew, they don't understand this the the first portion of seven years. They think it's the hundred and forty four thousand and then the rapture of the church. This is the same type of thing. What do, what do they think mostly, not always, but what do they generally think they need? If I repent. Well, guess what? During the seals, too, if you repent and you're like that guy on the cross, for example, or or you're here during the tribulation of the seals and somebody cries out to the Lord before their death and they, they truly believe in him and they, they ask for forgiveness like the guy on the cross did. He was forgiven and got to go where? He got to go to paradise. You see, it, it almost seems like there's the same type of thing going on 
because people have all been taught from Matthew. So if you've all been taught from Matthew, the majority of the people teach what? Oh, baptism isn't really baptism the way we need it. There's no real, you don't have to worry about that with the Holy Spirit. If we just believe, meaning if we just repent and we get the covering of the blood because they don't understand it, they think that's good enough. Hence, the sleeping church going through the tribulation and ending up in the rapture for those that wake up and those that commit to that repentance during the time of seals. You see, it's that same thing going on. It's, it's what we spoke about uh, on the phone privately like a, a, a day or two ago, which was, again, the Gospels and understanding who they speak to reveals a lot more than just the three different people in relation to the end times. A lot more than just pre, mid, and post. A lot more than, like we said, that we teach here in Ministry Revealed, that when we understand why everybody being taught from Matthew thinks the tribulation is only seven, it makes sense. They see only seven years. It makes sense. The, the, the 144 and the rapture comes before the seven years of Jacob's trouble. That makes sense because they've been taught from Matthew. Well, now this is also making sense that so many of them are seeking only repentance. Not all of them, but that many of them are seeking and speaking and teaching only repentance. Because why? The sleeping church is the group that's going to be here when repentance will be needed to end up in paradise. It's perfect. Right. It's perfect. Yep. All right. Let's talk for a minute about this. Let's, let's, if you will, Alan, go ahead and go to John 3. This is a good place to talk about that. It ties in exactly with what you just said. Yes, that's right. Um, let's, let's just look at this for a minute. Uh, John chapter 3. Let's mm -hmm. just start with chapter with verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, and no man can do these, things, these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, now that's very important. Unless someone's born again, they can't see the kingdom. All right, and here's what Nicodemus said. He said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, Jesus didn't even really address Nicodemus saying that second time thing, but here's what he did say. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Two very different things. One is seeing, one is entering. See and, and enter. About that. Yeah, this this was something that I never caught before. And again, it's something that we spoke about because I'm always looking now with end time eyes. But oh, and this is another thing that ties into this. This is something else I wanted to bring up earlier that I have never said that our understanding, this revealing of the end times, I've never said it's the most important thing. I believe it is the second most important thing for the season we're in. The number one most important thing is what you teach, what Torben teaches. It is, it is the repentance. It is the remission and the receiving. This is number one, and this is why we're bringing it up now at this point. This is the most important, is salvation. Number two is where we are that people can wake up and understand. And this is one of those things that the ministry... We've done this for two and a half years, catching these little words and these little differences. But in John chapter three, we, we don't really spend any time in John back in these, in these earlier chapters. And what do we see here in this revelation? We see here that those who are born again, which is what? Repentance, right? So unless you're born again, you won't even be able to see it. But if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you don't only need repentance, you also need the water and the spirit. So number one will give you the ability to see it. Number two, with water as the second and the spirit of receiving the third that we've been talking about, which is, he can't see this, but I'm going to show you guys, which is repentance, baptism and receiving is the repentance just for those who will be able to see it. 
But we are looking to enter. We want to go into the third heaven where the Lord is and be in the throne room standing before him. So we're not just looking for repentance. We want repentance, water, and spirit so that we can enter. This is awesome. When he went through this with me the, the last time, it was awesome. And I this is a, the piece that I really shared in Discord with people. And some just went, whoa. You see, do you want to do you want to be the one seeing who will be able to go to paradise or do you want to be the ones entering into the third heaven portion? It's it is the difference guys and this year John 3 1 through 5 this this is hands down no doubt this is what hooked me even more with what uh with brother Richard was saying. I saw it, I understood it. And I want to enter it. So go ahead, Richard. That's great. That's great. Let's 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 take that one step further here, if you would, uh, Alan. Go to First John chapter five, verse seven. This will even this will even take what Brother Alan just described. It will take it to the next level. Verse First John verse uh, five, chapter five, verse seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Yes. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. All right, now here's a question. What if you omit one of those? Do you have full agreement? No. Absolutely not. There's three to, to be one. That's, That's right. just like you don't take away from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're one. Yeah. You can't take away from these three, the Spirit, the blood, and the water. All right? Understanding that the Spirit is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yep. It's Which in reverse is, order here, yeah. Yeah, yes. And the water being the water baptism mm -hmm. and the blood, which is what we get through repentance by embracing Jesus' death on the cross. That's right. So this is this just kind of it kind of concretes that understanding of John chapter three that we just went through. That's that right. You do have to have the blood, the water, and the spirit. If right? all th yeah, all three are up there in heaven. We want to be with all three of them, yeah. That's right. So we're going to have to speed up just a little bit here because I've got a little bit more to cover, but I do okay. want to see these few things. Um, I want to explain this to you because a lot of people think that water, there's no need for water. I gave Alan these few thoughts the other day, and this is what I give to people when I'm teaching on water baptism. Remember in Noah's day, the earth was full of evil and full of sin. What did God destroy it with? That's right, water. Water. Matter of fact, Alan's the one that even said this. He said he baptized the earth. That's right. That was the thought that you got, and that's what he did. Yeah. Uh, if you would go and let's look at that right now, First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen, um, because this is a good understanding here. This will help people with water baptism. First Peter three eighteen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto what? Even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want you to see in there. I want you to get a picture of where you are, a boat. Just kind of raise your arm up and picture a boat where your arm is, and picture water all the way down to the floor. When the rains came and that water lifted that ark above the earth, those eight souls were saved by that separation that that water did. Mm -hmm. They were separated from evil. They were separated from the sin that was on the earth. There was a water separation. And here Peter makes it mention that they were saved. Well, they were saved from all the evil and, and the sinful thing. And it's a picture of our water baptism. God used water to cleanse the earth. 
That's he right. still does it. He started it through John the Baptist. It continued it on, and it helps us get that remission of sins. That's right. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here. You don't have to go here, Alan, but I'll just kind of mention the scripture. In Matthew 12, 43, uh, the Bible talks about when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. That if there's something about evil spirits, they don't like they don't like wet pit places. Mm -hmm. We have in uh, Luke chapter eight, we have the story of Jesus casting the legion of demons out of the man, and they wanted to go into the swine, and they did, and the, the pigs ran into the lake. Mm -hmm. They were full of this legion of demons. And so my personal belief here is this, because I've seen it. As a matter of fact, you can go to Brother Torben's website and see many times yeah. I've seen people baptized in water and demons come out. Yeah. Because when you get in the water in the name of Jesus and you unite yourself with his burial through your repentance and his death, demons can't stay. That's right. So if they start manifesting and they cast them out, don't be afraid of that. But that's just that's God's way of getting us clean. That's right. Getting this stuff out of us. So, so I just want you to understand, I, I, I'm having to go through this fast, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about water baptism. And, and again, I'm having to run through it real quickly. But it's giving enough to know and see enough scriptures to know this is the way God intended for it. Oh, yeah, we can right, definitely see. Ask, there's been a lot of scripture already. So, yeah, let's keep going. We can keep going for a bit. Go to Acts 22, 16. Now, this is going to be another uh-oh moment for those out there that may be doubting that water baptism does anything for us. All right, I'm going to give you the, the, the quick version here. Paul was giving his testimony of what happened to him in Acts chapter 9 at his conversion. He was, he was he had fallen off of the animal he was riding. He was blinded by the light of Jesus. Jesus told him where to go and told him to go wait for a man named Ananias. Well, Ananias came in and laid hands on Paul. And the Bible says he received his sight and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And right here he's giving that testimony. And here's what he said Ananias said to him. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So here Paul, Paul had repented. Now this is something else that we don't have time to go into this a lot. But we need to understand. After your repentance, you can receive the Holy Ghost. If your repentance is true and you embrace Jesus' his death on the cross, yep. you once that blood's applied, you can receive the Holy Ghost before you get baptized. What a, what now an amazing spirit. story. I mean, just just seeing this here and hearing you say that, I mean, it, it's a it's a testimony that I have. It, it yeah. is my testimony. It's the same type of thing going on, yeah. Well, it's the same thing that happened to me. I was a Baptist pastor. I had received the Holy Ghost before I began pastoring, but I didn't understand water baptism. I thought mine was still valid. Yeah. And I started studying this, and it's really what shook me away from the Baptist church because once I understand being buried with Christ into his death, and it really meant something, and I needed to do it in the name of Jesus, I basically got kicked away from the Baptist denomination. They <laughs> That's right, because they, they wanted like that. Yeah, they want you to do it in Matthew yeah. for their doctrine, and, yeah. And, and again, I'm not speaking that down, but I'm just yeah. saying that's what that's what shook me loose there. Yeah. And so I got a true remission of sins, and I was willing to step away from my job and my career. I was I was pastoring in a church that had 800 people on membership. Yeah. And I stepped away because the other pastor I was working with he wouldn't accept this. Yeah. And so I was baptized properly, and I got a remission of sins. But my point, all that is is the fact that once you truly repent, you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul did. Yep. Uh, we, we, could, we could go over right now to uh, Acts chapter 10. Remember the story of um, Cornelius mm -hmm. and Peter having the sheep come down to him? Drop on down there to verse 44. The whole Cornelius story and Peter goes to the Gentiles. Now, now, now get this. This is the first Gentiles that receive the Holy Ghost. This is a great, great story to go and read. Mm -hmm. Peter goes to their house. Jews and Gentiles aren't even supposed to be mixing according yes. to their law. Yeah. But they go here and say, while Peter gets to make these words, he's preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. 
The Holy Ghost fell on all of them that heard the word, and they of the circumcision, the Jews that were there, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's right. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then listen to what Peter said. Can any man forbid water? that he should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Now listen to what wow. he did. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. You see that? That's right. So so these were the first Gentiles. They, they had been living in repentance. Peter comes and preaches the gospel, and the Holy Ghost fell on them. Yeah. The Jews saw the Gentiles get it just like they did at Pentecost. And they knew they needed to be baptized. That's right. So understand how important that is. Very important. All right, let me see where we need to go for our remaining little bit of time here. Um, this is awesome. Yeah, I mean, just how many people are out there that have it in the way you did, that have it in the way I did? I mean, I know there are others. I, I know even speaking with Peter uh, yesterday, I know there are others that had it that same way, you know. The repentance, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, and then boom, here's a... Paul had it, and now we see it happening with these guys, these first ones. I mean, it's crystal clear. Yeah. Crystal. Well, let's look at two more passages, and then we'll bring it to a close because it's getting long. Okay. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 8. And again, this is where right here where we have to ask Alan to take off his end-time glasses for a moment. <laughs> That's right. We're seeing in the eight. now, not in the future. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Great point. Great point. All right. Let's go to verse 4. This is our brother Philip of Philadelphia that we know about in the last days. Mm -hmm. uh, the Church of Philadelphia, and this is him ministering, but he ministered in the is time. That's what right. was and is and is the time, it was a time that he was ministering, and now this is still the is time. That's right. Okay, very important right here. Uh, they, were, they were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the people with one, one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many that were taken with qualities in the, uh, that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, before we go further, let me mention this. I know there's a lot of brothers and sisters that haven't witnessed these kind of miracles in their life. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But please know that brothers like myself, and, and I only glorify the Lord in this. This is not about me. But but in the is, people have been experiencing this. Healing, miracles, deliverances. This has been going on, whether you've ever seen it or not. That's right. This is has been going on since the day of Pentecost. But... What we're expecting is like Brother Allen is teaching, that there is this latter time outpouring that's going to be tongues of fire. Well, we haven't received it that way. We received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but not the tongues of fire. Mm -hmm. That is to come. But this is happening. I just want you to understand that. That's right. I remember your certain... stories of you saying in Africa, without getting all into it, I mean, I was talking a little bit on that with Discourse yesterday, and I mean, that was some pretty wild stories that you told me with with what had taken place with these pastors over in Africa. I mean, that was just incredible. So, yeah, I think most people here listening and everybody listening knows that those things do happen, but maybe they haven't experienced it, but they, they've heard or they've seen videos and so forth yet. Sure, and, and, and it's okay. It doesn't mean that that diminishes you and your experience with God in any that's way. Right. That's don't right. Think that. yeah. All right, so verse 9, there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city you sorcery. And he wished the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Well, you can see that, as a matter of fact, when the Dajjal comes, what are they going to say? That's right. It's going to be the same situation. Yep. And, they, and to him they, they had regard, because for a long, a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Mm -hmm. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, repentance, water baptism for remission of sins, and receiving the Holy Ghost, that was the message, that was the gospel. Remember our, our first thing we, we posted up mm -hmm. there? Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose. That's right, I just then showed we them. Repent, then we repent. 
We're baptized, we're buried with Christ, and we receive. That's the message that he was preaching. Mm -hmm. All right? It says when they believed, they were baptized, both men and women. So that meant they repented, and they were water baptized. That's right. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now get this. Here's the interesting part. Now when the apostles which were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Now please understand, brothers and sisters, just because you believe, you don't automatically get the Holy Ghost. There are some that when they believe with repentance, yes, they can. They can receive it. But just believing doesn't give it to, give it to you. So right here, you see that they believed and got baptized, but the apostles came down that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet, he was fallen on none of them. Mm -hmm. They only were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then... They laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. You see that? Mm -hmm. Repent, be baptized, receive. That's the order, but you can repent and receive and then be baptized. The That's order right. can be shifted after repentance. I want you to understand that. I want to make that clear. After but repentance to start everything. Yes, it starts everything. And here's the thing. Once you get the blood of Jesus applied, the Holy Ghost can move in. That's right. Even though you still got the spots, the Holy Ghost can move in. That's but right. But you need that stuff washed away. Just like we read in Acts 22, 16, Paul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And Paul had received the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 9. Mm -hmm. But... Right, right at that time, he hadn't been baptized, so then Ananias commanded him to be baptized. That's so right. It's something to, to really understand. Now, let's go to one, one last place here. Acts chapter 19. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in there. Go to 18. Back up to 18, because this is very important. You and I talked about this in our last Yeah, I have that. Verse 24, yeah. Yes, let's look at that verse 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. All right, so think about this. Back up just a little bit. This man was eloquent. He was mighty in the scriptures. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit, and he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. That's right. Now, this was some years later after Jesus had resurrected, but this man was still preaching John's baptism. He was preaching repentance and a, a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Now, look what happened. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they heard they took him unto him and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, that's all we're doing right here. Is we come and we're, we don't know everything. We don't know every jot and tittle in the word. But we're just pulling people aside and expounding unto them the way of God more perfectly. That's what Brother Allen's doing with this end time understanding. That's right. He's just expounding it more perfectly. So this is the understanding. Now let's drop down to Acts 19 because that sets us up for it. This was in Ephesus. And so Apollos goes on to another place. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passes through Ephesus. Now remember, at Ephesus, they were preaching John's baptism. Mm -hmm. So look what, hap look what happens. He finds some certain disciples. So imagine walking down the road and you see these guys and they look different from everybody else. And so Paul calls them disciples. And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Now, how many of you have ever been out on the street witnessing? And the first thing you asked an individual was, <laughs> Have you received the Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. No, we don't do that. But why don't we? Because Paul knew that that's where they needed to have gotten to. And so he went to that place 
at the end, have you received the gift? Mm -hmm. And look at what they said. Look at what they said. We've not as so much as heard whether there is any Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so he backs up now to step two. He backs up to their baptism. And he said to them, unto them what were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to think about this. Knowing they had been baptized into John's baptism, he knew they had repented because, remember, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have to talk to them about repentance. That's right. He preached, he preached the gospel that Jesus had come and died. And when they heard that, I want you to see what happens. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means they were baptized in water. In the name of the Lord Jesus, they had already had their repentance. Yeah. Now they got their death and their burial. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. That's right. Clear as a bell. Clear as a bell. <laughs> yeah. So for all of you brothers and sisters out there that that received your water baptism long before you actually repented, yes, yes, by all means. Look at what the Scripture is telling you. You need to have a burial with Christ into his death. And yes, as a last point, we do it in the name of Jesus. That's what we're told to do. That's right. Right? And I told Alan this the other day, and this is not growing off on, on this group of people, but I went back because I'm the kind of guy that when something's broke, I don't like to just fix it. I want to know why it got broke. Mm -hmm. So I went back and tried to find out how did this get broke that we don't no longer baptize in Jesus' name and I found out that in the third century, a man with the Catholic Church named Justice Martyr, That's right. he changed water baptism in Jesus, in, in Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm sorry. He changed the water baptism that they were doing in Jesus' name to the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And when I saw that years ago, I went, oh, my goodness. I'm not going to do this the way that, that the Catholic man taught. I'm going to do it according to the Word. That's so right. That's important to understand. And I'm, that's the way that happens. I'm going to jump in with this too. So, guys, if you didn't really hear that very clearly, it was always a water baptism until about somewhere around 300 AD with this guy through the Catholic Church, right? That yes. ended up changing the water baptism into the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, like Matthew 28. And when they did it, think of who these people were that were doing it prior. Do you remember the 14ers? Do you remember the 14ers who were upset with the Catholic Church because they wanted to do an Easter and not properly based on when the true Pentecost would come? I mean, the true Passover, regardless of the day of the week. That's what the 14ers were arguing and why they became called 14ers back then. Because they were sticking with the scripture. This is the exact same type of thing. It's the Catholic Church that went in and changed it and said, and the guy even in his writings, uh, Richard had told me, even in his writings, he kind of gloated and boasted about how he changed it from being baptized in the name of Jesus to being baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here again, just like the original 14ers, here we are a group of 14ers in a different sense, but it's the same sense because we are looking to see what the Word tells us, the revelation and the understanding of the Word for what the truth is. And we're being revealed this same thing and finding out that it was the church in and around 300 again that changed it and had everybody baptized in that way. This is so we aren't part of the rapture. We want to make sure we are clean and ready for the escape. That's right. So let's, let's, let's do this. We, we've covered a lot about repentance. We've covered a lot about water baptism. Let's just make one last statement here about the receiving of the Holy Ghost because mm -hmm. we didn't really get to get into that teaching. But I do want to mention this. And it's something that we'll all understand once we see it, but we've got to understand it. If you would go to John seven thirty seven, right quick, Alan, and with your end time eyes, you know that that's the place that we still are currently. That's right. John chapter 7. So this is going to make a lot of sense. Verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, 
which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm -hmm. So here's the picture. This is Jesus promising about he's, he's going to promise the Holy Spirit, and it's going to be like rivers of living water flowing out of your belly. You see how he said that? He's speaking of the of the of the Spirit in that. Mm -hmm. That's what the Holy Ghost is. So the Holy Ghost is not a dam. The Holy Ghost is not a well. The Holy Ghost is something you receive that comes into you and flows out to other people. Mm -hmm. It's just this continual flow. It's a river. It flows out of your belly to people. And you can sense it when people have the Holy Spirit. Yes. And when they teach, there's like a flow of the Spirit that comes to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's talking about here now. To finish that off, go to Luke chapter 10, because here's what most people don't understand. Remember, remember back to when we first started this. What were the two things? What were the two things? I'm not going to put Alan on the spot here, but I want to I want to remind right here. What were the two things we learned that John the Baptist said Jesus would come do? Uh, sin and uh, Holy Spirit. He would take away the sin of the world exactly, yep. and he would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Those exactly. Are the two things. Yeah. All right. So look at the scripture in Luke chapter. Uh, 11 verse 10. I'm sorry, I may have told you 10. I meant 11. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 11 verse, verse 10. 10. Yeah. All right, listen to this. We all know this passage. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. If a son asks for bread, ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he... For a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Mm -hmm. You see that? That's right. You see that? It's very clear. So a lot of people receive it just by entering into repentance. A lot of people don't know to ask. But if That's you don't right. know if you've got it and you're living in repentance, if you ask, yep. we saw that up in Acts 2.38, it is a promise to you. That's right. And it, 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 it ends up covering where we would go next with this is, you know, as we we were talking before going live, there's I wanted to make sure to get this in because a lot of people had asked me, or a number of people had asked me this question. You know, in this, are, are we good to go here now? Like, are we good to go to this this portion of people with their baptism now? Richard? Sure, sure. Um, or did you want to did you want to finish up? I thought maybe it would tie in good, but I won't forget it if you want to finish up some things no, here. No, no, go ahead. We're good. We're, 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 we've covered about what we need to. Because I thought that was awesome, too. I mean, just this right here. I The reason it, it just triggered me to go to this is because... Would he not, you know, shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit? You see, if you ask him. So we were looking at another part where it was the laying of the hands and the laying of the hands. But it doesn't right. mean that if there's nobody near to lay on the hands that you still can't receive it. That's exactly right. You see, and I think that was an important part to bring up because in the discord yesterday, and I know people will be asking, especially because why? Brother, we were talking about this earlier. People are in lockdown. We're we're yes. in a time where yes. where people literally are not allowed to leave their home. And so one brother doesn't have a bathtub. And he says, "Oh my goodness, okay, well, I I I need to get baptized." He says, "Yeah, I, you know, I believe in what you're saying, Alan. I know what Richard has told you. I I'm following it. I get it. I need to get baptized, but I don't have a bathtub." And we said we talked about this off air, and I had said, "Brother, you get in with that right spirit knowing it's repentance and then the remission, the, the water, and then the receiving and the asking for the Holy Spirit. You can have your wife do that and baptize and say that over you and you understanding what you're doing. And then you do it for your wife and you guys do it over your kids. Man, you're good. Whether it's a bathtub and you don't have one and you can't leave your house, that's golden. You're, you're, you're okay with the shower. Now, the other question that a brother, another brother had was what do we do for somebody what about somebody in the lockdown situation i mean we're going right down to the nitty-gritty of the the absolute worst case scenario 
somebody's listening to this and they say, Alan, I, I want to, I'm nervous. What am I going to do? I haven't been baptized or I haven't, uh, I want to wash it away. But maybe I have a bathtub or I have a shower, either or, but I'm, I'm single and I'm in lockdown. I can't just go to my church or go to my neighbors and go to these places and do this. What do I do? What would you do, Richard? Yeah, you know, situations like that, I'm, I'm, I'm just like Alan is saying, when we have a situation like that, remember that it's not what is spoken over you when you get baptized. Yes, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you know that when you're doing it now, you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. But you're being buried with Christ into his death. And usually the reason somebody's there to baptize you is to pull you back up out of the water. <laughs> so if you're by yourself and you have a bathtub and you can get in there and, and, and get yourself you know, in the water and you know you're being buried with Christ and, and you're entering into that covenant with him through the repentance and the water baptism and you're doing it in the name of Jesus, to me, no problem. Because like Alan said, yeah. God knows your heart in this. He knows your heart. If you can't get fully immersed in water, just do whatever you have there to do it. But do it knowing what you're doing unto the Lord. He knows. Yeah. He knows the time that we're in. And then the other thing that he mentioned that's very important, I've seen many, many people over my years of ministry receive the Holy Ghost in their bed at night. The Lord would wake them up and the Spirit would come over them and it would happen. To them, so no, you don't have to have hands laid. Yes, that's the way that it comes, and that's yeah. the way that the Lord does it. His other spirit baptized people, but remember, when somebody lays hands on you, you're not getting the spirit from them. Yeah, you're being baptized by Jesus. Yes, He's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. We're just the conduit. Yeah, that's just like healing. You're not being healed by that person. We're the conduit that comes down the, that the healing comes through. So that's it's right. ultimately Jesus doing so. So don't let yourself get confused over these minor technicalities. Go into it with this right heart and this right understanding of Scripture and do what you've got. If I look at it, if you've got a bucket of water and there's somebody there with you and you do this, I assure you that if that's all you've got and we're that close to the end, God knows your heart in this. We're not, we're not getting this down so technical that that's you've got right. to do every little minor detail it's where your heart is to know that you're following god's word you're but that you have repented first yes absolutely. that you've repented first and like we said you know maybe most of you already have that repentance you know you've had you've got that cleanse you've got that repentance you you you're away from those things and maybe what it is is that washing and maybe still the receiving of the spirit as well that washing and that receiving and so for those, because I know this question is going to come up, for those that just have the shower, even if it's just them alone, and it's to go into the shower and doing and praying it over yourself that you repent from your sins, and then you walk into that shower to be washed of it, I would say don't do it as if you're just going to go shower now. Don't just say, okay, right, now I'm right. in here, I'm just going right. to stay in here. No, 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 no. And I'm saying this because I know that question would come up. Do it as if you're starting the shower because you're doing this with the purpose of being cleansed and then you step out of that shower turn it off step out of that shower and pray and ask for the holy spirit upon you and don't treat it like okay since i'm here i'm gonna shower don't do that right treat it as what you want it to be done as and i want to i'm just emphasizing that because i know in lockdown and people listening from all over the world there's different situations and if you don't have a shower and if you don't have a tub, but you've got some water somewhere, a bottle of water, then stand where you are and do that same thing in the understanding, in Jesus' word, with repentance first in Jesus' name. Do the same thing and ask for that Holy Spirit upon you. The Lord knows your heart. The Lord gets that's it. Right. That's right. And please, please know that we're not, you've got to be careful here because we're not building a doctrine that says if you sin, you need to go get baptized. No, that no, is no. Unscriptural. Yeah. Once you've been properly water baptized after repentance, if you have had some sin, confess it to the Father. He's faithful and just to forgive it. 
But you've got to know that you have entered into repentance and then had a water baptism. That's right. And from there on, we don't go get baptized because we commit a sin. That's right. We confess it to the Lord, and He's faithful and just to forgive it. So please understand that. That's right. And I'd like to mention this. If we're ready to close, Alan, yes. I'd like to mention one thing before we do. Um, I want to close with this thought. I want to ask a question. What is the most important thing on this earth to God? Just think about that just for a second. What do you think would be the ultimate, most important thing to God on this earth? It's people. Mm -hmm. If there were no people, there wouldn't be a virus. If there were no people, there wouldn't be cars, there wouldn't be houses, there wouldn't be ministries, there wouldn't be churches. So people are ultimately the most important thing to God. That's so right. here's my last closing thought. Look. Let's, let's understand that, that all people are important. No matter what they believe, no matter the way they're living right now, we're told in Scripture to, to honor all people. We may love the brethren. We're to honor all people. Mm -hmm. And please be careful, because when you don't agree with something, why are we backbiting and tearing down people just because they have a difference of opinion? Yeah. we got to remember that God, He is for people. So let's be careful of speaking things down because the Bible says with this tongue you bless and you curse. That's right. And you don't want to be cursing ministries and, and people of God because they're people. And so let's just be, be beware of that. I know there's negative comments that are going to come anyway, but, but please, just please think about that. And I noticed that Brother Jimmy uh, gave a scripture the other day to Alan uh, out of James, and it tells us to grudge not one another against one another and that's what i'm talking about here mm -hmm. so let's make sure that we don't curse a, a speak a curse over a ministry that so many people are gaining so much out of and i just encourage those out there that would be kind of negative please take that into consideration as we close amen all right brother i think uh we've got that one really good i i believe this was purposeful it was revealing it was complete it was understood we've got it on video so people can pause and rewind and see these things for themselves we are looking for clean see here it is brothers and sisters clean sanctified purified robes you all know this you've been watching ministry revealed long enough we are not looking to go to the to paradise Oh, we'll be able to go into paradise, but we're going to do it coming out from roaming in the third heaven. And we'll be able to go into paradise. But those in paradise won't be going to the third heaven. You understand? This is a cleansing of the robes. I understood it. I saw it from the moment I spoke with our brother. I understood why the Lord was, was holding them back and he understood it. And then why it's come now. Look at this timing. The, there was no plan on this back when he came across ministry revealed and he started following and understanding back last summer and look at where we are now all these things revealed and we get to this point and now right as we come to the tail end of all this revealing that has come in the time after israel has completed 70 we know we're here we've explained these things right that's what we were talking about in the minute in the beginning of this show we we've seen this we've we've expected this we know it's coming so we needed right here at this tail end, maybe not everybody, but a number of us, I know myself, and I'm sure there are others as well. We needed to get those garments cleaned. Some needed the whole enchilada, like Richard said, but some of us needed a bite out of the middle of it, right? We needed that cleansing. So guys, with that, uh, that this does it. Do you have anything else you wanted to say, Richard? Nope, that, that does it. I appreciate the time and, and the fellowship that we've had over this teaching and over the Word. Absolutely. I love it, man. This is this was great. I appreciate it. I thank the Lord for bringing you into us, uh, for bringing you in at this time and, uh, and revealing these truths to us to go in with the revelation. The Lord, guys, is preparing us for the third heaven to be standing before him. I absolutely believe it. Don't let this panic you. Just pray on it. Seek it with the Lord. And now we've explained. He's explained. You can understand regardless of what situation. The Lord will know your heart. So repent. Remit. Remission. And 
receive. All right, guys, we love you. We're praying for you. I want to give a shout out as well to those intercessors, right? A little encouragement. I, I didn't realize the intercessors that we had. You know, an intercessor would be somebody like our sister Jodell. You know, Jodell and what she what she bared what she bare upon herself to give me that word, to give us that word from the Holy Spirit in the last video. You know, there are others. I came across another one in the forum, and I know there are others that I don't know of. And I want to give a big shout out to those intercessors who are protecting me and my family and all of us here in this ministry, praying it over the ministry. I want to say thank you and to everybody that's just praying for us as well over me and my family and the ministry and each other, lifting up each other, protecting each other. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you always, and know that we're praying for you always as well on a daily basis. Nobody's not is is left uncovered. We are one. We're working together. Let's finish this strong. I love you guys. God bless you, and we'll talk to you soon. If not here, <laughs> up in the third heaven. All right, guys. I love you. Bye for now.